by God's grace and for his glory. This is Woodmont Baptist Church. that. Thank you, Kayla. That was excellent. I am Beth Howe, the Minister of Students and Adult Discipleship here at Woodmont, and we are so glad that you're here this morning. Um, it is spring break, so we know that many people um, are on vacation. It's also daylight savings time, so anybody decided to sleep a little extra, we totally understand. Um, my family may need a nap this afternoon to survive, but just glad that you're here this morning to worship with us and dig into Bible study together. Um, it's a great morning. Couple of announcements before we do get started and get our hearts prepared for um, worship and Bible study. There is no midweek activities this Wednesday night. It is spring break, so we will not have any, except for college Bible study will still take place tomorrow night, 7 p.m. in the library. Um, but we do kick off um, new classes March 22nd. That will be our new Wednesday night kickoff, so Pastor Nathan's um, study will continue. Then we start our women's Bible studies that Wednesday night and on Thursdays. If you want to know more, just go out these doors right here. You will see books. You can sign up, register, get your book. Everything you need, ladies, is right out that door. You can do right at the end of the service. Um, but let me take a moment to welcome and introduce our pastor this morning that will be preaching for us. This is Roger Severino. He will be our guest preacher today. Let me tell you, this man has got a long list of amazing abilities, so I'm sure that we will hear that come across in his sermon today that God has led him to preach for us. He is the Minister of Leadership Development at Brentwood Baptist Church. He is a graduate at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. That's a long one. And Beeson Divinity School. So he's got lots of degrees and an amazing wife that helped him through all that. Roger oversees the Middle Tennessee Leadership Institute, comprised of seminary partnership, ministry residents, interns, and lay teaching. Um, he also oversees Leadership Pipeline at Brentwood Baptist Church. So we're excited to have the local um, and native to Nashville here um, preaching for us this morning. So if you'll join us as we get our hearts together and prepared for worship, we're going to sing this morning. Amen. Thank you, Beth. What a joy it is to come together and worship this morning. So let's stand and sing hymn 26, God of creation, all powerful, all wise. Yeah. 
men, you may be seated. We invite all our children to come forward for our children's moment. Good morning. While our kids are coming forward, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Trevor Prather. I'm in the uh, kindergarten and first grade. Um, I'm thinking one day I might get to graduate, but for now I'm stuck there. Uh, how are you kids doing this morning? This morning we're going to talk a little bit about being ready. Okay, so I need you guys all on your feet really quick. We're going to do a couple stretches. How many of you guys, when you get up in the morning, you kind of uh, stretch to get ready? So when we sit for a while, our body kind of gets stiff. So we want to stretch just a minute. So take your arm, lift it up in the air, reach over, and bend. Uh, now switch to the other side, and bend. Uh, there you go. Now take one arm and put it in front of you. And then the other one will go behind the elbow and pull a little bit. There you go. Now do the other one. Oh. Now I want you to take one leg, if you can balance. Pull it up. There you go. Oh. Now do the other one. And then the one that makes all your parents jealous. Let's touch our toes. Oh, all the way down. There you go. Oh, nice and stretched. Okay. So now for the service, when we come to church, you can go ahead and sit down. Now for the service, how do we get ready, right? Because we come to church every morning, and we need to learn. So one way we can get ready is we can pray. So we pray to ready our hearts to receive the Word of God, right? So it's one of the reasons why we pray before the service. It's so that we can ready ourselves. So you can chat with God, and I have a little booklet you'll get at the end that kind of tells you a few of these things, and has a spot that you can uh, take some notes in. So our second point is to listen. Because if you come and you don't listen at all, does that do any good? Can you learn if you don't listen? No, right? You can't learn if you don't listen, right? And to help you listen, what's something you can do? What's something you can do to help you stay focused? What's something you can do to stay focused? Follow along with the pastor. That's right. Follow along with the pastor and take notes, right? So if we listen and take notes, and then to help us understand, let me tell you a little secret. Ask questions, right? If you ask questions about what you're learning, it'll help seal it in your mind. And let me tell you a fun one to do, too. Ask your parents what they learned, right? Try and catch them not paying attention because there are times when people ask me and I'm like, uh-oh. I, um, let me, Jesus, is that right? <laughs> so pay attention, ask questions. And then the last one is think about it. Think about what the pastor's saying. Ask yourself, what's this mean to me? What does Jesus want us to get from the lesson? What is he trying to teach us? So first we pray to ready our hearts, right? And then we listen and take notes to help stay focused. Then we ask questions about it. Ask, you know, what's this mean to me? Ask your parents, what did you get out of it? And then we think about it. So if you guys will see Miss Rebecca as you head back to your seats, and she'll give you one of these to help you guys this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor, for filling in for Miss Rachel as she's on sabbatical. It's always amazing how much the children's messages really are adult messages too, right? Uh, just learning and, and just the Bible is applied throughout all of our lives. Well, let's continue in worship this morning as we stand together and sing of the love of Christ. Let's worship.
Pray with me, please. Father, we feel your presence in this place. May we yearn for your presence each day. I pray that we might, as individuals and we as Woodmont Baptist Church, might seek to live each day more like the church we see in the book of Acts, risking it all for the advancement of the gospel, but clinging to the guidance of your Holy Spirit. May we live with that boldness. May we hold to that blessed assurance that Jesus is ours. God, we pray this morning for your work going on around the world. We pray for the people still reeling from the devastation of the earthquake in Turkey one month ago and those responding and serving to try to bring some healing and order to the chaos. We pray for organizations we, as a church support, like Send Relief, and for organizations like Water Mission, that my good friend is there serving and, and 
bringing potable water back to people who desperately need it. We pray for our own Rachel Gregory on her sabbatical in Australia as she helps with the kids' holiday event at St. Jude's Carlton. We pray for what is about to be given here today, Lord. Father, make all of these things work together for your glory and for the advancement of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
How great it's to be with you all this morning. Um, again, my name is Roger Severino, and I have known about Woodmont Baptist Church for most of my life and known several uh, folks connected here, and you've certainly been a, uh, a beacon of gospel uh, proclamation in this community, so I thank you for that. And on behalf of Brentwood Baptist, I thank you for back in the 1960s, this congregation, uh, about 55 years ago, had the foresight to think there might be just a few people moving out to the Brentwood area in the years to come. And they put some seed money and um, began a church called Brentwood Baptist Church. And I am here to tell you that, yes, there have been enough people that moved into Brentwood. And uh, so we are very thankful for your investment, and I ho we hope that we have been good stewards of your investment in us. So again, thank you for that. Um, I am somewhat of a native Nashville. I don't have roots here, but my dad took a job at Vanderbilt in 1969 when I was four years old, and uh, he was in the Spanish and Portuguese department. And so I grew up kind of out there in the Westmead area, went to Hillwood High School, went to Vanderbilt. Um, and then uh, during that time, became a Christian primarily through the ministry of Park Avenue Baptist Church over on Charlotte Pike, uh, there was a dynamic youth pastor that we had at the time, a guy named Dave Busby, and if you were around in the 70s or 80s and ever have, had the privilege to meet Dave, he was quite an, an amazing person and certainly had a lot of impact on a lot of us, both churched and unchurched folks. Uh, many of us are now in ministry or elders or deacons in our churches, uh, missionaries, and so uh, thankful for his legacy in our life. Um, as I mentioned, I went to uh, Vanderbilt University where I had the, great, the greatest thing to come out of that is I met my um, wife, Marianne, and uh, we have three kids, Stephen, who's 29, uh, Kelly, who's married, lives in East Nashville, 27, and then Jake, who's with us this morning, who's 22, and a recent graduate from Vanderbilt himself. Um, now, I didn't grow up in the church, but I did have a sense... Um, walking around the dead end of a dead end of Westmead, uh, looking up at the sky, and having a sense that there was a God, and having a sense that I, I wanted to connect with this God. And, um, and so I feel like maybe from early on, God was drawing me to himself. But I had questions, maybe as you have had. Um, how can I reach God? How can I be acceptable before God. Now, um, pre-pandemic, um, I used to work out at my local YMCA. Maybe you try to get your exercise in in some way. Uh, I'm now doing it in a different way. But anyway, when I was at the Y, I would get on these different machines. And so sometimes it might be the elliptical, sometimes it might be the treadmill. And I noticed on some of these machines that there were calorie counters, okay? So I would get on these, and, and after a while, I'd, I'd try and see what kind of shape I was in and, and see what kind of, you know, um, what I was getting for my efforts. And so I'd watch that number depending on how much time I spent on there. Maybe you've done the same thing yourself. And I try to see, okay, you know, I try to be efficient with my time. And so I want to see, okay, what's, what's going to give me the best bang for the buck? And so I would try the elliptical. I would try the treadmill. And then I discovered the Stairmaster. You know, you know what a Stairmaster is. You know, you get on one of those things and it mimics the idea that you're climbing some stairs and you're doing that for five minutes, maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20. And I noticed, I said, hey, I, I, this is pretty efficient. I mean, it, I'm racking up the calories here. So it seemed like, you know, that was the best bang for the buck. And so I started utilizing that as part of my um, exercise routine. So. Why do I share that story? I think in many ways in our mind, even metaphorically, we talk about climbing and achieving certain things, right? We talk about climbing the ladder to success, and we talk about climbing our way to success. And so, um, I don't know, uh, that's going to be part of our theme this morning. We're going to consider that. But what about you? Are there certain things that you are climbing towards, it's things that you are trying to achieve? Maybe... Maybe it is your career, um, maybe it is you want your supervisor's role or at least see another opportunity out in the horizon that, that you, you would like to be in that spot. Uh, maybe it's a relationship you're pursuing, maybe it is 
physical fitness, that, uh, that you're literally doing something to make sure that you're achieving those goals. And maybe it's about um, just maintaining wealth or even financial security during these times, right? I mean, the stock market's down, interest rates are up, uh, we have inflation, so it's kind of a harder thing these days to, uh, to really rely on that sense of financial security. But what about the eternal? What about things that are beyond this life? What about our spiritual lives? Can we climb our way to God? Is there a stairway that we can climb and reach God, even if it's metaphorical in some way? Was Led Zeppelin right? Is there a stairway to heaven? If you grew up in the 70s or 80s, you might remember that song that came out in the early 70s. Can we buy it? Can we climb this stairway? I don't know if any of you are guitar players, but I remember one of the most meaningful gifts to me was in ninth grade. I got a Yamaha FG331 acoustic guitar for my, uh, not for my birthday, but I think it actually was for Christmas. And, you know, if you played guitar back then, you had to learn those first few riffs of Stairway to Heaven. But what are ways that we as humans try to reach God? Well, let's consider three possible answers, Okay. Uh, morality, religious ritual, and mysticism. So let's begin with morality. Many people try this route to be good, you know, and being good's a good thing, right? We want to have neighbors that are good. We want to have a society that is good. We want people to treat us in a civil way, particularly maybe in a culture that's sometimes becoming polarized. We like civility. We like uh, we like uh, people to be moral and kind and good. But one of the problems with this is how do we know what's good enough? Do I simply have to live up to my own standards? Well, what about the psychopath who has no conscience whatsoever and who may do evil? Are they okay? How do I know what the standard is? And what if, what if God's standard is different than my own. What if God doesn't grade on a curve like my English teacher did back in high school? Romans 3, as many of you know, says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, if the standard is the glory of God and God's perfection, then wow, that's that's a mighty standard. So what what if morality is not a guarantee? What if I needed a savior because my own righteousness falls short? What if I need mercy more than I need justice? Let's think about religious ritual, all right? We're all here, we're gathered in a church, a religious place. You know, many people think that religion and the rituals that go with it is what connects me to God. In the, in the Christian tradition, this may look like you know, going to church, getting baptized, participating in the Lord's Supper, maybe, uh, identifying with the Christian community. Surely religion and its rituals help me connect with God and be acceptable to him. Well, according to the Bible, that's not necessarily the case. We read accounts of the prophets, people like Isaiah and Amos, who say things like, you know, these people, they honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. Or you come to me with your um, religious festivals and your sacrifices, and you do all these things thinking that you're pleasing me, but you're not pleasing me. You're pleasing yourself, and you're oppressing your neighbor, and you're treating people in unjust ways. Jesus himself, right, when he was on earth, he often reserved his harshest criticism for the religious leaders and those who are deeply involved with religious rituals. Okay, what about mysticism? Mysticism can often promise a type of oneness with the divine. You know, maybe I simply need to have a mystical experience and be in touch with the divine within me. Well, from a Christian understanding, we do have some sense that the hope of God's indwelling presence in us, but so should we simply seek a mystical experience mystical experience, but the problem is the Bible is pretty clear that there is a God and you are not he and I am not he. And there's a vast 
immense difference between the God of the universe and our own frail humanity. So for us to experience the divine indwelling, God must do something first. He must initiate a change. But even then, we never lose that immense difference that we have between our creator and the creation. We are not God. We are not divine. So is there a stair way to heaven. Well, before we try to answer this question, let's look at at an interesting dream that Jacob has in Genesis 28 and the stairwell we find there. In a minute, we'll be reading from Genesis 28, 10 and following. But before we do, let me give you some background to the story that leads us up to where we are in this narrative, okay? Back in Genesis 12, God made a promise to Abraham that uh, he would uh, have land and he would have descendants and he'd have this blessing and he'd be a blessing to, to, to the nations. And we learn that this promise will go through his son Isaac and later Isaac's son Jacob. Jacob has a twin brother named Esau. You may remember that, that Esau was actually born first and because of that he should have had some of the uh, benefits that go along with being a firstborn benefits of inheritance and other things. But in Genesis, Genesis 25, we read about the story of Esau, who in a moment of great hunger comes back home. Maybe he's out in the fields uh, hunting or doing whatever he's doing, and he's, he's just famished, and he just wants something to eat, right? And, and here's Jacob. He kind of, he's kind of a little bit more of a, a mama's boy, stays at home, and enjoys cooking, and he's got, got this, this great red stew that he's prepared, Right? And so his brother Esau comes in. He's famished. He's so hungry. Give me some of that stew. He said, I'll give it to you if you will sell me your birthright. He says, what do I care about my birthright? I'm famished. I'm starving. Give it to me. So he sells his birthright to Jacob. Later in Genesis 27, when Isaac is old and his eyes growing dim, he calls his sons to bless him. Knowing that Isaac will give the firstborn special blessing to Esau, Rebekah and Jacob, they scheme a plan together. You see, Esau is kind of more of a man's man, a, a, a dad's boy. He's out there, right? He's out there hunting, doing all these things. And Jacob has his mother's heart. And so they take advantage of Isaac's poor eyesight to deceive him and make him believe that Jacob is Esau so that Jacob gets this special blessing. Now, you can imagine how Esau feels about this and how he feels about his brother. So by the time we get to Genesis 28, Jacob is fleeing for his life from his brother Esau, and he's also going back to his family clan up north to find for himself a wife. All right, one more comment before I um, read Genesis 28. Can I be honest? I've never been a big fan of Jacob. Now, does that sound heretical? Does that sound sacrilegious, not to like one of the patriarchs? Well, let me explain. Much of my life, I have read the Bible through the lens of looking for that good person or looking for the hero, right? Well, Abraham, he gets the blessing. He must be the hero I'm called to follow. There must be something innately good about Abraham. God chose him, so he's the hero. Let me see. Let me see what Abraham does. And let me watch Isaac, because Isaac, you know, he, the blessing goes through Isaac, and that's very clear. So he's the hero of the story. So, hey, Isaac is my example. And then we get to Jacob, and Jacob, the, the blessing goes through Jacob. So again, let me look at Jacob and let me imitate his life. And then I read about Jacob, and I say, really? Jacob? He's the person I should be like? He's a trickster. He's a deceiver. He's a swindler. Should I be like that? Abraham and Isaac, you know, they had their shortcomings, but this guy? But at some point, I realized that I was probably reading the Bible wrong, the Bible narrative wrong. I don't think it's primarily about the humans and the heroes. Certainly there are examples we can learn. Hebrews 11 tells us about that. But I think there's only one hero in Scripture, and that hero is God. And sometimes that God, all the time that God, 
uses imperfect people, imperfect people like Abraham and Isaac and even people like Jacob and perhaps even people like you and me. Now, Genesis 28, 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. Then he reached a certain place, or when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone and he placed it under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey that I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Well, let's consider three questions from this story that we just read. What do we learn about this stairwell or stairway? What do we learn about God? And what do we learn about people? So let's begin with the first one. What do we learn about the stairway? First, I do think that stairwell or stairway is a better translation. Some of your translations may say ladder on it. Uh, you may, we've heard about Jacob's Ladder. I think there's even an old song that climbing Jacob's Ladder. Uh, most scholars believe it implies a flight of stairs like those constructed on ancient ziggurats. So what a ziggurat is, they're monumental temple towers found throughout ancient Mesopotamia. They were commonly built of sun-dried mud and straw bricks, Stairways ascended to the top of these structures where a small temple or a shrine sat on the summit. So what's the difference between a, a ladder and a stairwell or a stairway? Well, presumably, at least on a stairwell, you can have people going up and down at the same time. Much as we see in this story, the angels, the messengers from God who are both ascending and descending... That's a little bit harder to do with a ladder, right? Uh, but what else do we know about this stairway? This stairway. It encompasses the space between heaven and earth. And the only beings that are going up and down this stairwell are, are God's heavenly messengers. Jacob is not climbing the ladder. In fact, he is asleep at the bottom of this ladder. The Lord stands above the stairwell and he speaks to Jacob. So what do we learn about God? God takes the initiative to pursue Jacob. Also, God takes the initiative to pursue us. The good news of the gospel is not that we have somehow constructed and found a way to be good enough or smart enough to reach God, but that God has come down to us. Notice, Jacob 
isn't even seeking God in this story. He, he admits in verse 16, he says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't even know it. God pursues Jacob to confirm his promises, the promises that began with Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob, promises of land, descendants, favor, and his gracious presence. God makes a promise that through Jacob's offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. From the New Testament perspective, this promise is ultimately fulfilled in Christ, the ultimate seed or offspring that come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can look at chapters like Galatians 3 to get a better and fuller understanding of how the new covenant understands this fulfillment. Zooming out from this story, does God still take the initiative to pursue us who are undeserving like he did Jacob? Again, in Romans, we find these words, Romans chapter 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the New Covenant, we find a promise of an eternal home, of his mercy and favor, of his presence, all based on what Christ has done for us. He grants these promises to all of us who respond to Jesus' offer by grace through faith in him. So finally, the third question is, what do we learn about people in this story as exemplified by Jacob? Jacob is scared, right? He's fleeing for his life. Jacob is weak. He is tired. He is poor and needy. One of the ways we might see this is that he actually has to use a, a, a stone for his pillow, right? He doesn't even have anything to wrap up to put under his head. In addition, Jacob is clueless about God. He's not praying. He's not seeking. He admits in his dream that he was not even aware that God was in this place. He wakes up with a certain fear and awe, and this is understandable, right? He has just had a dream and an encounter with the Almighty God. Does this mean Jacob is a changed man? Is he now committed and devoted follower of God in response to God's blessings and his promises to Jacob? It doesn't appear so, at least not yet. He makes a vow that sounds more like a bargain with God. It's conditional. You know, if you do this, then the Lord will be my God and I will do this. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me the bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Sounds like someone who's bargaining with God. Now, later on in his life, I do think that there's a change in Jacob. Perhaps it takes wrestling with God and walking away with a limp that brings about this change. God humbles him. And then perhaps then Jacob is finally able to surrender so let's get back to the story. Is, is there a stairway to heaven? Let me suggest, no. Now, before you protest, or before you despair, let me say that there's something much greater than that. There may not be a stairway to heaven, but there is a stairway from heaven. See, this is not the story like the story of Babel, right, where man in his own ingenuity thinks that he can reach God and create a way for him to reach the heavens and to be like God. This is not that story. It's not Jacob who climbs the stairway to God, but it's God and his angels condescending to Jacob and making his presence known. Again, as we zoom out from this story and look at the broader 
storyline from Scripture. We find echoes of this. We find this particularly in the first gospel of John. Excuse me, the, sorry, the gospel of John. The gospel of John uh, in the first chapter, okay? So um, in, cha- in John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51, you may remember this story. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good from there? Good come from there, Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What is Jesus saying in this last verse? I mean, he is clearly alluding to our story, is he not? He is talking about Jacob's dream. Well, the radical claim I believe that Jesus is making is that just as God condescended to Jacob and made his presence known, now Jesus is God's presence. Jesus is the decisive, ultimate connection between heaven and earth. Jacob called that place Bethel, which means house of God. And what we learn here is Jesus is saying, that now he is that Bethel. He is God's dwelling among people. Of course, John's gospel, even earlier, had already told us this, didn't it? At the very first verse of John's gospel, we we read this, and then we're going to skip forward to verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This word, this logos, which is the the Greek word behind what we translate word, we know this to be Jesus. We know that he, according to these passages, he is the incarnation of God who has come to show us the way and ultimately to die for our sins and to be raised from the dead for our salvation. You see, being moral and being good doesn't by itself help us to reach God. Observing religious rituals by themselves do not lift us up to God. Mystical experiences are not the stairway to heaven. When we could not climb our way to God, God came down to us. Well, not me, maybe one of you says, you don't know my story. If you know the real me, my secret thoughts, what I have done, there is no way that God would want me. Listen, our pastor likes to say that 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 greatest failure and sin in your life, that greatest source of shame becomes, can become, the first line in your testimony. Here's who I was, here's what I did, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy, God brought me to himself. He forgave me of my sin and made me his child. He put me on a new path. And here is who I am now in Christ. 
How is it that God chose Jacob? Jacob was not, not seeking God, as we've talked about. He's often a trickster, a deceiver, a swindler. And yet God shows him his grace. And maybe this is a certain scandal. Walter Brueggemann, who's an Old Testament scholar, has this to say about the story of Jacob. He says, The narrative about Jacob portrays Israel in its most earthly and scandalous appearance in Genesis. This narrative is not edifying in any conventional religious or moral sense. Indeed, if one comes to it with such an agenda, the narrative is offensive. It is nowhere argued that Jacob is good or honorable or respectable. This grandson of the promise is a rascal whose purpose is tangled in a web of self-interest and self-seeking. Jacob is born to a kind of restlessness so that he must always insist, grasp, and exploit. His life is a scandal from the beginning, and therefore the powerful grace of God is a scandal. Interesting. The scandal of grace. Why is grace scandalous? Because God offers mercy to the undeserving, like Jacob. Jesus makes the hated Samaritan the hero of his story, scandal. Think about your political opponent that you maybe on your worst days despise. What if Jesus made him or her the hero of the story? Well, that's how the Jews would have felt about making the Samaritan the hero of the story. Jesus makes a traitor like the tax collector the hero of the story and not the religious leader once they both leave the temple. You see, because the tax collector, the sinner, knows he's in need of forgiveness and he pleads for God's forgiveness. Scandalous. Jesus portrays the father returning out to greet his prodigal son who had asked, had the audacity to ask for his inheritance early and then goes off and squanders it. Jesus has the father running out to greet him. Scandalous. Who felt comfortable around Jesus during his earthly ministry? Well, he was called a friend of sinners, but not as a compliment. Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, says this. Though the crowds call him the friend of sinners as an indictment, the label is one of unspeakable comfort for those who know themselves to be sinners. That Jesus is a friend to sinners is only contemptible to those who feel themselves not to be in that category. Question, are you in the category of sinners who desperately needs Jesus? Then Jesus welcomes you. If you are among the proud, the self-righteous and self-sufficient, that's when Jesus is far off. So you may be wondering, well, who am I talking to this morning? Who, who is my target audience? If you have a beating heart this morning, I'm talking to you. If you are here this morning and you, you have not yet professed Christ as your Lord and Savior, this message is for you. Your sin and your doubt do not disqualify you. Consider Jesus and his offer for forgiveness Consider his claims, and my hope and prayer is that if you encounter the Jesus of Scripture, that you will embrace him and that you will understand what it means to be a child of God and a follower of Jesus. If you are here and you profess Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you wear the name of Christ or Christian, this message is for you. Earlier in my faith, I believed that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, was only for unbelievers. I thought the gospel was the entry point into the, into the Christian life, and then you moved on to something else. Dear brothers and sisters, one of my friends likes to say the gospels are not the ABCs of life. They are the A to Z of our lives. We don't ever get beyond the gospel. We just get further into it as it continues to transform us. 
When I was growing up, there was also a commercial, some of you may believe, that said, orange juice, it's not just for breakfast anymore. You know, those makers of this product wanted to make sure that if we drank this beverage, we no longer had to limit ourselves to the morning hours. We could take it at any time. And so I am here to make a declaration to you that the gospel is not simply for unbelievers, it's for all of us. And yes, it is most precious to the unbeliever, most precious to the one who, who does not net yet know Christ to embrace him and his offer of salvation. But it's for us, for everybody that's here. I know for me, I uh, forget the gospel every day. I may have to relearn it, re-preach it to myself every morning when I get out of bed. The most important thing about me is that I am a man of God. That I am a child of God and that Christ Jesus is Lord. The most important thing about you this morning, if you are a believer, is that you are a man, woman, boy, or girl in Christ. That is the most important part of your identity. It is Christ and Christ alone who secures our righteousness before God. It is Christ and Christ alone who secures your salvation, that your sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. Whoever you are, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, embrace this truth, embrace this good news that Jesus is a friend of sinners like Jacob, like you, and like me. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that when we could not reach you, when we not, could not climb our way to you, that in your mercy and your grace, you have come to us. Yes, you came to Jacob through the stairway from heaven, and you revealed yourself to him. But more importantly, as we look of the history of salvation, as we who are blessed to be on this side of the cross and the resurrection of Christ, we know that you have come to us in Christ. We know that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to your mercy that you have saved us. We are so thankful for that gospel, so thankful for that truth. Lord, help us to surrender to that. Surrender to your mercies, and may it transform us. May it change the way that we live, knowing that our Christ identity is the most important thing about us. It's not our jobs, not our careers, not what our bank account says, but it's you. Lord, to whom else will we turn? You alone have the words of eternal life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now will be an opportunity for you to respond to this message. You may do so silently from where you're sitting, but for some of you, you may want to come forward. It may be that you want to join this great church. By the way, I, I, Nathan and I have had many connections uh, the last several years, including the, fact that, or, uh, including the fact that my sister taught one or two of his kids. But we've known each other, known of each other, went to have the Beeson connection, but he is just a fine pastor. I got to meet him. We get to break bread at uh, Chewy's uh, in, in anticipation of me being here, and just a real kindred spirit. So I can wholeheartedly endorse this as a place where uh, you may want to uh, join and, and really sink your roots and be part of this community. So if you're interested in doing that, you may do that this morning. If you want to learn more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus and giving your life to, to Christ, there will be those here at the front that are ready to receive you. If you just need someone to pray with you, again, there will be those here at front who can do that, okay? God's blessings. Let's stand and respond as we sing Amazing Grace.
exciting day for our church. I don't know if you realize how exciting it is, but as a staff member who's only been here nine weeks um, today, I think, maybe a little longer, it really isn't exciting. I have Blaine Keller. Come on up, Blaine. Blaine has met with Pastor Nathan, and I've heard a little bit about his story, even though we've just now put a face with a name. Um, but he wants to be a member of this church. And so um, this is an exciting day. He's coming from another Baptist church, so he would just be a transfer of letter. But if you, as members of Woodmont Church, would affirm him as joining our church and being a member here, would you say yes? Yes. Thank you. And I love, this right here is the family you've got to get to know, the Roberts. Do you hear that loud yes affirming? They're a fantastic family. Blaine, you need to get to know them. Um, they have three kids in our student ministry. Amazing family. You should get involved in students. See, when you allow the student minister to do this at the end, we recruit. <laughs> Christy's giving me the thumbs up over here. Um, but yes, we are really excited to have your family. He will be standing here at um, the front, and he would love to shake your hands. Um, so if you, as our church, would welcome them in, he will stand up here at the end, um, and you can welcome him. He does have his lovely bride with him. Um, she's going to do it a little differently, but we're excited to have her as well. Savannah, right? Perfect. I remembered a name. I'm excited this morning. It's even a better morning when I actually remember things um, and lose sleep. But we're so excited to have them here. We're excited that you joined us for worship day. Thank you, Pastor Roger, for filling in for us this morning. Our pastor is on vacation. Um, be praying for them. It has not been a vacation without bumps that have happened. His mom has actually been in the hospital for dehydration in Mexico. So as you would just pray for them, um, it looks like part of the family is coming back on the cruise and part is having to stay in Mexico. So we're gonna pray for safety as they make that trek back. Um, it's hard when a vacation turns crazy. Um, so if y'all will just be praying for the Parkers, that would be great. Um, I'm gonna pray us out, but one announcement just to remind you, budget cycle begins for Woodmont April 1st. So we are in that budget time of Q&A. That will happen on March 22nd at 6 p.m. Those budgets right now are printed for you at any exit door if you want to grab those and take a look at it. But we will discuss that at March 22nd at 6 p.m. All right, I'm going to pray us out in benediction. Pray with me. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace. And don't forget to come meet Blaine.
This has been the live broadcast of Woodmont Baptist Church. If you would like to know more about the people and programs at Woodmont, or if you would like to stream both live and pre-recorded services, go to woodmontbaptist.com or call us at 615-297-5303. This program is funded by the members and supporters of Woodmont Baptist Church and is produced by Woodmont Baptist Television. Thanks for watching.